week on the Magic Collegiate Podcast, I'll be joined by the remarkable researcher and author Gary Osborne. Gary's books include The Shining Ones, The Geese of Prophecy, The Serpent Grail, The Rendlesham Enigma, and many more. Gary's the third member of the Magic Collegiate Research Group and is responsible for laying the foundation for a series of history-changing discoveries that have resulted. These discoveries are detailed in the Magic Collegiate documentary series, now in its fourth season. The focus of our 15-year research project was described as a forensic recreation of ancient science through a study of ancient aesthetics and symbolism. The project compiled and studied hundreds of examples of didactic art and architecture. Didactic means to teach. It was an entire style and ethos of early art, where a hidden message or an entire encyclopedia of sacred, scientific, or esoteric wisdom could be encrypted into a temple, a tomb, or an ornamental relief by literally hiding it in plain sight in the art. In the composition of statuary and hieroglyphic reliefs, and even into the architectural blueprints of the temples. This unorthodox research project yielded a series of amazing discoveries that were hidden in the art and architecture, using a number of ingenious visual techniques, including a technique known as Gestalt Switch encryption, demonstrated and documented by later artists like Da Vinci and Michelangelo. Contrary to the current orthodox view of ancient Egypt, the art tells a completely different story of our past and seems to indicate an almost totally unappreciated degree of intelligence and scientific sophistication hidden in plain sight in the art and architecture of not only ancient Egypt, but much of the rest of our most distant ancestors. Why has this gone undiscovered for so long? Art speaks in many types of languages and modes, some of which are widely known, and some are only known to artists who've dedicated years to the study of these lesser-known modes of visual transmission that was in use in ancient Egyptian symbolic artwork. We call it biometric correlation, and it can be described like this. In the way that the female form has been the subject and focus of artists throughout history, and has been expressed in myriad ways, in styles, in paint and stone, there is a period of time in art history where the subject, the template, was the deepest secret of human consciousness. The biometric brain parts, the origin points, the touchdown points, where the material body gives rise to consciousness. Welcome to the Magical Egypt podcast, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here with the man, the myth, Gary Osborne. Uh, it is a huge pleasure to see you once again. We're here to talk about a recent development, a fairly recent development that is bringing a kind of um, official vindication, official uh, validation of some work that Gary's done. Gary's been a pioneer in this discovery of human biometrics in ancient Egyptian art, and he's been publishing his work for a really long time. There's been a recent publishing of a white paper. It's a peer-reviewed white paper, scientific paper done by neurologists and some scientists that basically claim to have discovered this thing that you've already discovered and published, but because they did it, it's it's legitimate. You know, when we do it, it's not legitimate, but when they do it, it is legitimate. So we're going to come back at this. And not only are we going to continue to publicize the work that we've done and the dates that we discovered it, because it's, it, you know, it's out there in the public record. We've published lots of stuff about this five or six years before this article came out. You've been publishing for um, at least a decade. Since 2003, since 2005, really, with the books. Let me, uh, let me just try something. Can you see that? Can you see that? Yeah, that's that's my article, The Gate of God. Yeah, that was um, now that was written. You know, a lot of that was written in the late nineties. But wow, I kind of I kind of went back into it when I was writing the Shining Ones in two thousand and five, and a lot of that was going to go in the Shining Ones book, but it didn't make it. It was just too much. It was just too much, and it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a, a big book anyway. And uh, yes. it, all that wouldn't have fitted in there. And I just turned that into an article and put it online. But a lot of people, uh, it's become like a cult classic to it for a lot of people, you know. They, uh, they will use it as reference. I mean, it's an amazing body of work. It is just an amazing body of work. And um, 
So yeah, yeah Gary's been making these discoveries and we're going to talk today about uh, some of the fundamental discoveries you've made that are just absolutely groundbreaking. In my opinion, they're as important as anything that Champollion has done. It kind of signals almost a new era in understanding and reinterpreting ancient Egypt. And the reason why it's kind of suppressed and the reason why it's gotten sort of hesitancy or resistance from Orthodox Egypt is um, Gary and myself and Brad Clausen and, and John Anthony West and Graham Hancock, Robert Baval, we're all kind of uh, exponents of this dissident voice, this alternative voice about ancient Egypt. In the Orthodox view, the Zahi Haiwasas and the Mark Laners of the world, are really sort of dismissive and downplay the intellect and the scientific sophistication. Whereas um, our camp, the, maybe the symbolist camp, all of us are kind of following in the lineage of Schwaller de Lubix, who not only brought to bear Egyptology, but he was a multidisciplinarian. He was a geometer, he was a mathematician, he was a symbolist. And he yeah. really understood uh, occult and theosophical symbolism. And when you understand symbolism and you understand the art that Egypt speaks in, you understand the modes of expression that Egyptian art speak in, you really see a very different picture. And that picture of Egypt is nowhere, a very, very remotely resembles the Orthodox picture of Egypt. They're much more intelligent. And they seem to have a science that was kind of the inverse of our own, where in modern Western science, the only question that really hasn't been answered yet is the nature of consciousness and the mystery of you know, the consciousness and its role in the universe. In ancient Egypt, it seemed like that was the central focus of the science and that they were all about this one thing that modern science still can't explain. And so modern Egyptologists tend to be very dismissive about this and about our work because the really, in, in my opinion, and the things we're going to look at today show that the very most interesting things about Egypt are these scientific expressions that were unified with the art. And yeah. this was an era of art. I think that was art at its highest purpose where it was unified with the most important um, ideas of a culture. Yeah. Your, your idea, what came to you about the pylons? I think it was, it's the Karnak temple or is it the temple of Luxor? But you, but you came to that in 98, which was around the same time I came to that um, Horus I, uh, Phalamus in the brain kind of correlation. Um, and really, the reason why I, I came to that is because I looked at those uh, fragments of the Eye of Horus, um, fractions, I should say, fractions. And you know, they're in numeral fractions. You know, 164th, 132nd, you know, uh, there's all these there's the fractions. I think there's six of them. Now, five of them are the senses. Are the senses, you know, like smell, touch, taste, sight, um, hearing. But there's a sixth one. And no one really knows what that sixth one means. And they call that the missing 64th. Because it is 164th, which is the part of the horror side where you see the stem underneath at the front. And... It, they say it's a hypothalamus, but really it's pointing to the pituitary. And then you've got the eyebrow of the eye of Horus, which is the corpus callosum. Now, when I was first looking into all this, uh, I did. The reason why I, I connected the, heart, the eye of Horus with the brain, and you look at it in a sagittal view, um, a cross-section sagittal view, uh, was because I knew that those parts of the eye of Horus those fractions of the ioras did line up with the sense regions in the brain. The classical Egyptian eye has each part or each component of this That's it. has a fraction associated with it. And so here's what's interesting about this. Um, so here's the fractions. Can you see that? Yeah. Each one of these fractions is associated with a sense, and as Gary is pointing out, an, an additional sense that no one's acknowledging. So people often say, well, it's not a big deal to cut a head open and just draw what you see. But the additional significance here is that they not only were drawing these brain parts, but they were doing these indications of what the functions of these brain parts were. Uh, yeah. And that is really significant. When I first started looking into this, because really I was researching my own experience I had in 93. So it all kind of followed from my research into that experience. And I was looking at the Hindu Vedas, um, tantric 
earliest sort of tantric sources, Hindu sources, um, the esoteric stuff that goes far back into like the mists of kind of, I don't know, prehistory, I guess. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it was sourced from, from then uh, and then made it into the Vedas. But I was looking at what they were saying about the third eye. And see, we've always, in the West, we've always kind of, the third eye for us is the pineal gland. It's just the pineal gland. But there's a triad. This is a triad in the brain. So you've got a pineal gland, which is associated with a male energy the pituitary gland, which is associated with female energy, and you've got the thalamus in the center, which is the neuter or the neutral kind of point, or it's kind of, uh, I don't know, um, a mix of the two, mix of the, what would you call it? Um, what they, the androgy, the androgy, androgy. it's androgynous, yeah. yeah. And uh, sexless, if you know, or, or a fusion in the two. But uh, I've, what I found was is that these three things like the, i mean the glands pinning on the pituitary gland and the thalamus were all components of the third eye not just the pineal these all had to be working the, the, the chemistry between them it had to all be working for the third eye to open and the optic thalamus was the part in the third eye that was most important but it it's a triad it's like the trinity Absolutely correct. It's not just a pineal gland, but it's a triad. And it seems to be the biological basis behind, uh, there's so many things in theology of all different uh, cultures, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Larry, Moe, and Curly, uh, you know, all the uh, traditional, um, um, that's a joke, that last one, the Three Stooges. Um, but, uh, but you know what I mean, the, uh, the, the triad of, of uh, deities, and I was talking with Brad the other day about this, that it might well turn out that the whole idea of religion and the whole idea of God worship and stuff is kind of a modern projection that we're putting on the past. It might well turn out that what we think of as them worshiping deities was really them trying to put into terms the triune or the, you know, the threefold system that creates consciousness. Our universe is, I mean, our consciousness is our experience of the universe. And so yeah. when they talk about these three gods, you know, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, for instance, the creator God, the preserver God, and the destroyer God, this really has this unusual resonance with those three components you just mentioned. And then yeah. the famous Caduceus, the Ida and Pingala are like the... Um, yeah, well, well, the Ida, which is the female, is associated with the pituitary gland, it's when, when you look at the Hindu illustrations, you'll find that the Ida is kind of striking the pituitary gland and the Pingala mouth, uh, nerve, which is, they're serpents, symbolized by serpents, they're striking the pineal or the pineal gland, you, as you Americans say. Um, pineal, the pineal, pineal gland. The That's pineal a mighty fine pineal gland you got there. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. And you know, you've got the Sushumna, which is the central nerve channel, and that goes straight up to the thalamus. But well, the thalamus is actually the first thing, you know, with the zygote, you know, when the... Wow, I didn't know that. The first thing that forms is the, is the thalamus. Wow. It's the source. It's the source of the being. And yeah. Wow. So, so when people say connecting to source, you're connecting to your uh, thalamus. That's awesome. Yeah. So when I was researching into these earliest esoteric, um, I don't know, textual... Uh, commentaries on 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 this on the thalamus it was the thalamus yeah that was most emphasized and uh you you and you go looking for it you'll find it everywhere in in those in the vedas and uh i realized there was no one else talking about it there's no one else talking about the thalamus at the time when i was putting all this together this is interesting so really interesting similarity between the scarab beetle and the sutures in the top of the skull and yeah. then uh, we'll go on to, um, yeah. uh, I mean, this, this is all Gary's work. This is just simply amazing. There's one graphic that I want to find here that just kills me. Okay, so here is, I'm just going to play this back. This is an uh, animation I've done based on Gary's research. But to start by understanding these biological things, there's the corpus callosum, and this is yeah. the thalamus. This is the thalamus that Gary's talking it's about. The open, it's opened up. It's the thalamus that's opened up. This is the thalamus opened up. And then when it's closed or when it's um, sealed, it, it looks has like a bottle. This, 
Yeah, yeah it's uh, it is basically uh, here we go. So it's in a shape like that. We're going to be talking about this particular uh, hieroglyph and some other uh, derivations of the Atchev crown and the Atchev motif. Gary discovered that this is, for all intents and purposes, a schematic of the diencephalon, including these amazing, um, the uh, corpus callosum, the amygdala. Uh, Anyway, go ahead with the thalamus. Yeah, I mean, you'll find that also in alchemical artworks uh, of the bottles that has the war in dragons, one's red and one's black. Or no, the, is it um, red? The uh, Athenor, the Athenor. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Good. I'm glad you, you mentioned that. So um, you'll find, yeah, as I said, you'll find this in chemical drawings, but that is part of the Atif crown. That's the central part of the Atif crown. Wow. And of course, you're looking at the brain from underneath. When you see that axial view, so from the bottom up, yeah, the yeah. front view is the I forget what it's called the coronal view is to the front, sagittal or sagittal view is from the side, and this is the axial view, which is um, up yeah. and down. This is the view, and of course. Under. The, the Yatif crown, um, it has um, the horns. Um, I don't know what that part of the brain is called now, is it? Um, some sort of ligature. I'm not, I'm not certain oh, called. I know what that is. Just one second. I know exactly what that is. Here, check it out. This is the uh, the splenium of the corpus callosum. Yes, that's it. I did know it. I did know that name, but it's just one of you know. After a while, you just forget these things. To tell the truth, I haven't talked about this for years, really. It's a testament to how long ago you did this research. This is old hat for you. And it's only now that modern science is coming to acknowledge and vindicate. Yeah. What you've but you done. can see, you can see the orbs of the typical Atif crown, you know, the orbs. You've- yes. So let's look at those. First of all, you see the third ventricle aligned there, uh, the pituitary gland and the Atif crown. And in this Canum's Atef crown exa- matches yeah. exactly with the pituitary gland. And before that, here's the pineal gland, exact right. match all the way through. There's the pineal gland. This is remarkable. For people who say that what we're seeing is confirmation bias or that we're seeing Jesus in toast, tell me that this is Jesus in toast. I mean, you've not only found here the pituitary gland exactly matching, the pineal gland exactly matching, the ventricle, anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what's interesting to me? Did you ever see I Dream of Genie back in the 70s? Yeah, of course, because it's like the genie bottle. It's the genie bottle. And so from Legends of Adla- uh, Aladdin um, yeah. and all this, make- yeah. that it is this... and. Oddly, I don't think they meant to do this, but it's just in the zeitgeist that I dream of Jeannie, the bottle she lived in, was this exact shape of the third ventricle or the thalamus depiction. And it really has this weird resonance with the legend that is, I think, a tantric or kundalini metaphor that when you're doing this uh, sexual abstinence, sexual cultivation, you literally generate a genie in this bottle through sexual transmutation. You develop this magical kind of entity that can grant you wishes. And the whole admonition, never let the genie out of the bottle. If you're cultivating or you're doing sexual um, uh, retention and then suddenly you fall off the wagon, there's dire consequences, which is like letting the genie out of the bottle. And the more you do it, the more it does indeed grant you some wishes, gives you magical power. So I thought that was an interesting aside here that in all cultures and all times, these, this knowledge seems to have been a hidden stream of uh, esoteric wisdom. So there we have the corpus callosum here in the yeah. Atef crown, and the, there in the Atef crown. Go ahead, Gary. And those are ostrich feathers on the Atef crown. Yeah, the Atef crown. The ostrich, the ostrich feathers. feathers, or sometimes uh, people say the feather of Mott. So here's the splenium of the corpus callosum. I mean, this is not Jesus in toast. This is an, a remarkable. First of all, kudos to you for having seen this, because this is absolutely undeniable that they were not only schematizing this diencephalon, but they were doing it in, in particular in conjunction with Canum, the god. And the god was, this god in particular was the god who was um, supposed to have formed man. You see him a lot with a, f- holding a clay pot with a fire yeah. inside, like putting the soul in the body. What, what do you know about Canum? No, he was the creator god. And you usually see him with a potter's wheel. He's creating uh, humans. 
from the pots as well, funny enough, the clay, the clay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what you said about the genie bottle is really, really quite good. I mean, it's, I never thought of it that way, but when you, when you bring it up, you see it straight away. So I, and I think that was actually based somehow on, the, on what we see here. I just want to say to you that um, how I came to it was because I became familiar with the Atif crown. And then uh -huh. I, saw, I saw a drawing of the brain underneath by Lies, Lies, L-U-Y-S. Lies, okay. It was a drawing that was, that was in um, one of the anatomy books on the brain. It's it, going back to probably the 1800s, I think. I don't know. But it was a drawing by him. It looked just like the Atif. You know, I thought, that's it. It just jumped out of me. And then I, you've got to look at it closely, more close, closely than you than what you see, first of all. And then you go into it and then you realize, yeah. Not only did you find out, I mean, not only did you demonstrate <laughs> that this Atif crown and the Kanum crown was showing this part of the diencephalon, but there's an even more specific and kind of eerie correspondence that you found after that. This um, Atef symbol, this ornamental kind of uh, motif, not only corresponds in the same way to the diencephalon, there's the same pineal gland alignment, the same pituitary gland, the third ventricle, the anterior horn of the ventricle. But this is amazing. When you do a cross section mm. at the hippocampus, this thing mm. is the illustration of the hippocampus. Of yeah. It's I the mean, two serpents. You cannot, I mean, how can you say that this is confirmation bias or that you're seeing Jesus in toast? I've never seen a more accurate representation of a brain. There's the fornix, there's the hippocampus, mm -hmm. and the amygdala, and these little mm -hmm. dots uh, are just perfect, perfect representations of the uraei, of the, the uraei of the, the two serpents. Yeah. striking one strike in the pineal and one strike in the pituitary. Kind it's like, like it's like it's like it's the same schematic but put on the outside to show um the kind of the, the physio kundalini chakra system and the, the serpents of the chakra system or uh, not the chakra system but you know the uh the, the two nerve channels somehow someone had told the ancient egyptians about these power centers in the brain. And they said, what well, if you make your a hat like this or a crown like this, you know? So we passed down through the centuries as a schematic, you know, a, a diagram, kind of like a living diagram of, of the brain, be passed down to future generations. Mm -hmm.